Okay, gonna look at the uh, surely. Okay, do you guys have your scores? Yeah, maybe we can go over. Ah, okay. And um, um, <clears throat> yeah, do you want to do that first or? <laughs> Okay, check along the way. Okay, I'll try to read out the answer. If you need the answer, just let me know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, we're still waiting, but um, let's kind of just get ready to get started. Um, I'm not going to use black, I'm going to use a different color. Blue, all right, blue will work. Okay, so we're going over multiple choice today. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we're almost at AP Chem. AP Chemistry is the first test. So it's gonna be the hardest, yeah. And then um, we still have class next Sunday. Um, there's also spring break AP classes. Uh, if you can come in, that would be great. Um, the office uh, will contact your parents and let you guys know. So even if you have to be away, just be online. I think that'll be the best. Okay, so let's look at that. Well, we'll just go as, as we re review. First question okay, is about intermolecular forces. Which of the following liquid is dipole dipole? Dipole dipole is polar. So you're looking for who is polar here, right? So the answer is D. D is the only one that is polar because A is diatomic, nonpolar. B is tetrahedral, hydrocarbon, nonpolar. C is tetrahedral, nonpolar. They have all the symmetries that allows the dipoles to cancel. So D is the only one, even though it is tetrahedral. Yeah, it is tetrahedral, but the dipoles are unable to cancel. Yeah, so number one is D. If you graph CH2F2L, you see the CNF has dipole, but it doesn't cancel with the CHs. So although tetrahedral, you have to have identical bonding atoms. So that's intermolecular force. Number two, which helps to explain why increasing temperature increases the rate. Now, if you ask to explain, increased temperature increases the average kinetic energy of collision, right? So when you have more collision energy, so the energy of collision, more of them can overcome activation energy. So EA, activation energy. So that means it's faster, okay? So that's kind of the thought process, okay? So temperature to speed to kinetic energy of collision, and ultimately to the amount of collision that has greater energy than activation energy, and leading to uh, more product, right? So number two, the answer would be D. A higher temperature, higher energy collisions happen more frequently. So you get more product. So number two is also D. Okay, number three. Okay, uh, when we do these questions, you can actually do it pretty fast. I'm slowing down, just kind of regurgitate a little bit. So next one, number three is bonding. You're looking for something that's hard, something that is solid, okay, at room temperature, does not conduct electricity as a solid, but become conductive in water. So that has to be ionic. So that's how they would describe ionic. So the answer is A. Okay, hello, come in. So ionic solids, so we are number three, going over multiple tricks. Yeah. So again, uh, ionic compound, uh, ionic solid is a non-conductor, uh, but in aqueous or uh, liquid, it is a superconductor, right? Because you free up all the ions or uh, liquid form then you are conductor, okay? And the only non-metal conductor is graphite, so please memorize that, okay? Graphite is uh, carbon, yeah, it's a non-conductor, okay? So ionic solid is a non-conductor, the only non-metal conductor is graphite that we need to know, All right? Number three, and let's go to number four. Number four is Haber process, you've seen this equation, delta H is negative means exothermic, yeah? So this is Le Chatelier. So the question is, uh, which of the following changes results more NH3? 
So that means you want to shift equilibrium to the right. Uh, that is how you get an H3, yeah. So this is Le Chatelier. So you have to go through all choices, yeah? They're all gases, and delta H is negative, so it's exothermic. So if you look at A, okay, replace powdered catalyst with a Q, no, that's callus, yeah. Okay, callus is not gonna shift equilibrium. Callus does not shift equilibrium left or right. B, increase temperature, you always shift to the endo. And endo is left. You want to shift to the right. Nope, so endo is left. So B is not gonna work. And the answer is D. D is the answer. If you add nitrogen, which will shift to the other side. So adding nitrogen will shift to the right. Okay, that's the answer, yeah. And shift to the right will produce more ammonia. That's what you want. You want more ammonia in the mixture, you would have to push to the right. All right, let's take a number five. Okay, number five, yeah. Oh, we only have Brownsman. Hi, Brownsman. Okay, so which of the following arranges the molecules in order of the bond energy? So bond enthalpy means bond energy. Which one is the strongest? Which one is the weakest? Nitrogen is triple bond. So that will be the greatest, yeah, bond energy. Triple bond is stronger than double bond, which is oxygen, which is stronger than single bond. So diatomic gases, uh, most of the other ones are single bond. So the answer here, number five is A. Okay, this is good, number six. Mm, I have to move down like this. All right, number six. Number six has to do with uh, Coulomb's force. <laughs> You see these ions, they give you the radius, and the question is Coulomb's law, which is the charge versus the distance, right? So you wanna have the weakest Coulomb's force. So again, uh, Coulomb's force has to do with K, Q1, Q2, which are the charges, and then the distance of separation, yeah? So R squared, okay? So R squared is the distance between the charge. So in this case, we're looking for water, for example, a molecule versus that of um, uh, lithium, okay? So if you look at, uh, you want the weakest interaction, so want the weakest charge. So don't pick calcium, calcium is two plus, and don't put indium is three plus, so forget about that. So we are comparing sodium versus, uh, what is it? Sodium versus uh, lithium. So because sodium is a bigger ion, larger radius, so the force is less, okay? Lithium is a very tiny ion. So the distance of separation will be closer. So when the charge is the same, look at the distance of separation, yeah? So who has the weakest? The answer is B with sodium. Okay, so again, these have the same charge. Lithium is one plus, sodium is one plus, but lithium is closer to water. So closer to water means a stronger force. Smaller the distance, stronger the force. And you want the weakest one, so the answer is with sodium. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, and this, this intermolecular force, don't forget, this intermolecular force is called ion dipole. It's between the ion and the polar molecule. So it's ion dipole force is stronger than hydrogen bonding, yeah if they don't give you other additional information. Seven, the seven has an activity. So instead of giving you a periodic table, they give you this. So we're looking for who has the increasing bond polarity. So the bigger the difference in electronegativity, the bigger, the, the greater, the, the more polar the bond, right? The bigger the difference, the greater the bond polarity, okay? So we're looking for, uh, which of the following arranges binary compound in order increasing bond polarity? All right, so you look at the difference in electronegativity. The answer is A, because S and F is the most different than Si and Cl, then carbon and hydrogen. So if you look at S and F, S is 2.5 and F is 4.0, so the difference is 1.5. Hi. Okay, so we're going over question number seven right now. And SI here is 1.8 and CL is 3.0. So you see the difference is 
And the last one between carbon and hydrogen is only 0.4. So the biggest difference is between S and F, yeah? Okay, so number seven has to do with bond polarity and you just have to calculate the differences in the electro negativity, okay? All right, let's look at number eight. Number eight has, is one question, number eight. <laughs> So if you look at question number eight, we have this question, and all these are ionization energy. You see this energy needed to remove one valence electron uh, from an atom in the gaseous phase. So this is the first, second, and third ionization energy, yeah? <laughs> For element X, which of the following is most likely explanation, explanation between the large difference between second and third? <laughs> well, the reason is because X only have two valence electrons. X has two valence electrons. That's why there's a big jump between the second and the third ionization energy. It only loses up to two. The third one requires you to remove an electron from an inner level because you already lost a valence. So the third electron requires you to remove uh, from an inner level. So that's why the answer is C. Uh, C is the answer, yeah? So what does the C say? Uh, that the electron removed during the third ionization energy is much closer to the nucleus. So let's look at an example, right? Because let's say for example, magnesium. So if you look at magnesium, it's uh, argon, no, not argon, neon. Let me write the entire electron configuration. It's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. And then if you look at Mg plus is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. And if you look at Mg2 plus is simply 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So if you ask to identify the first ionization, you're removing an electron from 3s. Second ionization energy, you're removing an electron from 3s. But look at that. If you remove the third, third ionization energy requires you to remove an electron from level two where the first two removing from level three. It is easier to remove the electron from level three. It is harder to remove an electron from level two because of C, right? The electron removed is closer and is more attractive. It's greater Coulomb force. Okay. That's number eight. That's only number nine. Uh, number nine, we have a titration graph. Let's take a look at this graph, please. <laughs> Hey, yikes, this is, uh, someone just jumps around. Okay, so this is number nine. Okay. So you can see this titration graph here. Okay, you have, um, <coughs> you have uh, the most vertical region is the equivalence point. Yeah, so make sure you identify, or know how to identify the equivalence point. The most vertical region is the equivalence point. So in this example, okay, is about, 20 some mils, yeah, okay, let me uh, put it over here and just discuss that a little bit. So whenever you do look at the titration graph, there's three titration graph. This one is a weak acid because it starts with low pH, titrated by a strong base. Okay. Um, this is a weak acid with a strong base titration. So you always identify the most vertical region. This is the equivalence point. And you can see the pH equivalence like 9 point something, yeah? And then it takes about 25, 26 mils, I don't know, 25 mils. That is the amount you need to reach equivalent, divide that by two, you will get the half equivalence, yeah? So this is the half equivalence. And half equivalence is always when pH equals to pKa, always, at every, any kind of titration. So we have two points to identify here. So this is the weak acid. So this titration will begin with a weak acid HA, and it's gonna be all conjugate base at the equivalence point. And when it's halfway, the amount of acid must equal to the amount of A minus. Conjugate pairs are equal, as always true. So they want you to talk about this. So do you see it's not a strong acid, so A and B is just wrong. This is a weak acid, okay? And you titrate with a strong base, C. That's your titration. And you can see that the pH of the equivalence point is greater than seven because of the conjugate base. So because of conjugate base, yeah? So when you have these kind of titration, type two titration, pH is going to be greater than seven. 
Now, if you look at the type three titration, in which you have a weak base titrated by the strong acid, they simply combine. This kind of titration, the pH starts high because it's a weak base. And you also have this characteristic graph, the most vertical region. Wow, I have it. The most vertical region is the equivalence point. And if you start with the base at the equivalence point, you have conjugate acid. That is why it's acidic. Okay. So when you are at the equivalence point, titrations do not have to be neutral. The only time you are pH 7 is when you have strong and strong. Then that equivalence point is 7. But when you have a weak base like this one with a strong acid, pH is acidic because of conjugate acid. When you have a weak acid titrated with a strong base, as in question number eight, then you have a basic solution because of conjugate base. Okay, so there's very little understanding, it's more like memorization here. Yeah, so make sure you know how to do those. All right, next one is this one, number, uh, what is this one? Number 10. Okay, if you look at number 10, you have two samples of magnesium equal mass replacing to HCl. So this is a single displacement. You're trying to put uh, magnesium with acid, single displacement. So you're going to get magnesium chloride and a bunch of bubbles of hydrogen gas. So you've seen the single displacement before, bubbles of hydrogen will pop out. So what is the difference? You have two samples, right? Equal mass. So the question is, <clears throat> right? Uh, particle representations of the mixing in the two reaction vessels are shown in figure one and figure two. All right, so I only see this one, so let me move up a little bit. So this is figure one and figure two. So what's the difference? This is surface area. Figure one, you have a chunk of magnesium, not good, because they're not accessible to other reactants. Figure two is better. You have little chunks of magnesium. So increase surface area. Figure two must be faster for sure. So this is a surface area question, yeah? <clears throat> so number 10, plus C is the answer. So who's faster? Two. So forget about one. One just, you know, common sense tells you a chunk of metal doesn't react well. You want a small surface area because there's more exposure of the reactant to each other. So that's the answer. Okay. D is wrong because it says figure two has less surface area. It has more surface area, right? So common sense. All right, let's look at number 11. So number 11, we have empirical formula. Number 11, so because you can't use, cannot use calculator. So one way is that um, you, you still do it because the number looks okay. You know, you just convert grams to mole. So for example, 12 grams of carbon is one mole of carbon. And hydrogen is eight grams, so that's eight mole of hydrogen. And oxygen is uh, eight gram, that would be 0.5 mole of oxygen. Then the next step is divide by the smallest mole. So you get divide by 0.5, divided by 0.5, divide by 0.5. So the ratio for oxygen is one, for hydrogen is 16, for carbon is two. So um, did I read this one right? Let me see, yeah. 12 grams of carbon, eight grams of hydrogen. Oh, sorry, three grams of hydrogen. I read it wrong. Yeah. I, uh, okay, let me, let, me read, let me do this again. Okay. So again, uh, you have 12 grams of carbon, that's one mole, and you have three grams of hydrogen, that's three moles, there we go. And eight grams of oxygen, that's 0.5 moles. Then you divide everything by the smallest mole, which is 0.5, divided by 0.5, divided by 0.5. So carbon is two, hydrogen is six, and oxygen is one. So that makes B the empirical formula, okay? Let's number 12. Number 12 looks like a KSP question. When you do KSP question, you gotta watch out for the number of ions. So if you look at the first one, PBCO2, there are three ions. So do you guys remember that KSP is actually 4X cubed? If you have three ions, it's 4X cubed. And if you look at the second one, CUCL, there's two ions, so KSP is X squared. And if you look at the next one also, silver chloride, two ions. So it's X times X, X squared. And the last one, Mercury chloride, okay, that confused a lot of people. That is three ions because it's mercury one is diatomic and two chloride. 
So that is three ions as well for mercury two, uh, mercury one chloride. So KSP is also four X cubed. So we're looking for the highest concentration of CO minus. So technically you got to solve. So if you look at that, it's probably the first or the second one because it's so big, right? So the KSP for first one is 1.2, 10 to the negative five. For the second one is 1.6, 10 to the negative seven. So I'm gonna solve for X for the first two. The last two is just way too small. Now, how do you use, how do you solve this without using calculator? Like that, yeah, okay. So, you know, you gotta use calculator. So you estimate, you know? So if you were to solve for this, X cubed would be three times 10 to the negative six and one third of this. So like approximately one times 10 to the negative two, all right? So C or minus is twice, two times 10 to the negative two. Because C or minus is two X here. And the second one, you also have to suck it up and do it. So X squared is 16 times 10 to the negative eight. So X is four times 10 to negative seven, uh, four. And that is C or minus as well. C or minus is just X. So between A and B, who has higher C or minus? The answer is A, right? So your magnitude is larger. So if you take a best guess, everybody will pick A just by looking at the KSP. But what I'm, why I'm doing this is technically, you cannot just look at KSP. You have to look at uh, X, molar solubility, and then also 2X for chloride, yeah? Uh, so you actually have to solve for X. But if you guess, the answer is gonna be A, uh, with the biggest KSP should have the greatest concentration. But technically you cannot, you gotta solve for it, okay? So anyway, the answer is A for number 12, if you had to guess it. Okay, let's look at the next one. Uh, number, thir uh, number 13, um, I didn't get to that. Let me look at number 13, what's number 13 here? So this has to do with um, kinetic molecular theory about the distribution, yeah? So we need to remember this, that either you shift to the right and down or you shift to the left and up, okay? So that's kind of how you shift this bell distribution graph. Number 13, okay. higher temperature, you shift to the right and down. So you still start from zero, you shift to the right and down. So this would be at, uh, let's say for example, 600 Kelvin, where originally at uh, 250 Kelvin, okay? You shift to the right and down. Now this also true when you become smaller. So let's say you have two different gases, the smaller gas will be faster. So it's similar to that of the higher temperature, okay? So for the smaller gas, which is faster, it's going to be the red line as well. So think of that as, uh, this would be the smaller molar mass. Smaller molar mass is faster. Uh, so faster gas and the slower gas will be the black one. <coughs> and which gas is slower? <coughs> will be the larger okay. molar mass, okay? So right now they want you to compare hydrogen versus helium. Hydrogen is in black, helium is dashed line. Helium is bigger, so slower. So helium would be the one that is higher peak. So number 13 is A, yeah? So again, helium is slower. It's kind of like at higher temperature, yeah? And hydrogen is the solid black line. It's, it's gonna be right and just at a temperature. So number 13 is just memorization. This one we talked about several times, please memorize them. You can look at different temperature or different molar masses. Okay, let's look at number 14. 14, 15, I think they're together. And it looks like it has a law with, uh, with E, cell potential or reduction potential, yeah, okay. So let's take a look at the question here. We have hydrogen peroxide decomposition. Remember I said that uh, you always see hydrogen peroxide on AP tests, okay? So here's uh, an example of that. So if you have two hydrogen peroxide, this is number 14 and 15, and they will decompose into water and O2. First of all, this is redox reaction, right? Because peroxide is one minus, the oxygen is one minus, 
and ox oxygen in water is two minus, free element is zero. So hydrogen peroxide is simultaneously oxidized and reduced. That is, that happens quite often. Same species become oxidized and reduced. Anyways, then we have two more equation. This is Hess's law. So you need to find out how do I manipulate the two equation to get to this one on the top, right? So do you see that in order to do that, okay, let me take a picture and then uh, I can write on that, right? Right now I can't. So you just do Hess's law, okay? So what do I have to do to the these two equations to get to what you want, right? So if you look at hydrogen peroxide, it is clear that you have to flip the second one because only the second one has hydrogen peroxide. So once again, right here. So you can see that uh, hydrogen peroxide would be the marker. This is the only one. So I have to flip the second one and then double because right? I want two hydrogen peroxide. However, E does not change value when you double. E can only change when you flip, so it will negate when you flip. And the first equation, my marker is water. <clears throat> I don't want to use oxygen because oxygen is there in the first and second equation, not good. Water is the marker. And I notice I want two water on the right. I do have two water on the right. So this one stays, <clears throat> yeah. So what this means is that I can now do Hess's law and get to the overall 0.55. So let's say the question mark is X. So the first one stayed is 1.23, yeah, I didn't change. The second one I flipped times two. So whatever X is becomes negative, right? Okay, because I flipped, X is positive, I flipped it get negative. And I add them, I get 0.55. So I have 1.23 minus X equal to 0.55. So X must be 1.23 minus 0.55, so 0.68. So X is positive 0.68. So this is positive 0.68 volts, okay? As written. Now we're almost there. So now let's see what the question wants. If you look at the question, it wants you to find out number 14. What is the potential for this reaction? So we got 0.68, right? So the answer is C, okay? Not negative, okay? So positive. So 14 is C, okay? That's the word. Okay, so you set up Hess's law and figure out what to do with it. And let's look at 15. 15, if you look at this one, uh, what is true for this decomposition? Well, since E is positive, cell potential is positive, this must be spontaneous. So spontaneous reaction, we said delta G must be negative and equilibrium constant must be greater than one, which means you favor products. So 15, which one says delta G is negative? Equilibrium constant greater than one, and the answer is C as well. Yeah, only C, delta G is less than zero, and equilibrium constant is greater than one. And that is always true if your equation is spontaneous. Yeah, okay, so we got 15. So far, they're very easy, right? <clears throat> Number 16. So 16, that has to do with it looks like Lusha to Leo or something. Okay, I'm gonna keep going down. Uh, number 16, which of the following most likely increase the rate? Okay, so it's not Lush Atelier because rate has nothing to do with whether equilibrium shift left and right. So you can only increase the rate by several methods. You add a catalyst, you increase surface area, you increase concentration of the reactant, and you increase temperature, right? So what do you have to do? 16 is B. A, you decrease temperature is wrong. B is adding a catalyst. It doesn't matter if it's heterogeneous catalyst or homogeneous callus. Heterogeneous means different states of matter. Like this one is all gases. If I insert a metal solid callus, that would be a heterogeneous callus. Homogeneous means I, my callus is also gas. So that's what that means. Doesn't matter, it's useless that term, okay? So the answer is B, all right? Callus speed up the rate. Now C and D will shift equilibrium but will not affect the rate. So don't confuse. Shifting equilibrium left and right tells you nothing about how fast the reaction goes. Number 17 is a little structure, and you want to know which one is least soluble, means most nonpolar. So the most nonpolar will be the one that is least soluble, right? 
So I'm looking for nonpolar. The answer is B, because you're tetrahedral and you're nonpolar. Yeah. So remember, uh, I gave you four ways to tell whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar. Uh, so <clears throat> B is the only answer. Yeah, that's nonpolar. Okay. So don't forget the four ways. We have the seven diatomic molecules to be nonpolar. Can you memorize it, please? So the half crinkle, right? Hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, wrinkle, B-R-I-N-C-L. Also, uh, any hydrocarbons. If you only have carbon and hydrogen, you're nonpolar. Any noble gases by itself is nonpolar. And all the symmetrical shape. So the symmetrical shape, you need to know the molecular geometry. Okay, number uh, number 18, let's take a look at this one. So number 18 has to do an intermolecular force as well, and also solids and liquids. Yeah? So number 18 says, at room temperature, I2 is a molecular solid. Sure, solid, right? So which of the following provides characteristics of I2? So what is a molecular solid? Molecular solid does not have high melting boiling points. So a is wrong. Molecular solid is soft. Ionic solid is hard, right? Now molecular solid C is the answer. Molecular solids do not dissolve to form conductor. There's no ions. So molecular solid has no ions, the molecules, the covalent. So they're not good at conductor electricity, yeah? Right? Because they share electrons, so the electrons are stuck. And D is wrong, I2 is nonpolar, so it's not soluble in water. Okay, so 18. Let's go 19. So, so far we have quite a bit of intermolecular force. 19 is also intermolecular force, yeah? So 19, based on the information, which liquid has higher vapor pressure? So the one, the liquid that has a stronger intermolecular force will be harder to vaporize. So the one with stronger intermolecular force has lower vapor pressure, harder to vaporize. So who has stronger intermolecular force? Look at the boiling point. CCL4, the boiling point tells you that it has stronger intermolecular force because the boiling point is greater, okay? So CCL4 has higher, stronger intermolecular force and therefore has lower vapor pressure, yeah? The stronger the intermolecular force, the harder it is to vaporize because intermolecular force is pulling you back from vaporization. So you know the answer is C and D based on the boiling point. Not the side, don't look at the molar mass, okay? Look at it, boiling point is the empirical fact. And so the answer is C, right? It has stronger intermolecular force because stronger dispersion. CCL4 is London dispersion. It is nonpolar tetrahedral, right? So C is the only answer. So more intermolecular force, lots of it. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, next one here is number 20. 20 has to do with equilibrium. Okay, they want you to understand what is equilibrium constant greater than one? What does it mean for this acid and base? Yeah, so I know this is acid and base reaction because I see protons getting transferred. Right, the hydrogen from HX donates to Y minus. So this is an acid and base reaction. So acid become conjugate base. So HX is acid, X minus is the base. That is a conjugate pair. More, I have Y minus is the base and HY is the conjugate acid. So there's two acid. There's also two bases. As with every single acid and base reaction that donates proton. There's gonna be two acids, one on each side, and two bases, one on each side. Now to tell which acid is stronger, you look at the equilibrium constant. Because the equilibrium constant is greater than one, that means equilibrium shifts to the right. The right side, the products are favored, okay? Equilibrium will shift favorably to the right because K is greater than one, there's more product. This means the left sides are stronger. The left acid is stronger acid. The left base is a stronger base. That's why they push the equilibrium to the right. 
The stronger atom on the left will donate the proton. The stronger base on the left will accept the proton, forcing equilibrium to the right. So if the equilibrium constant is greater than one, the left side is stronger. The opposite is true, right? If the equilibrium constant is less than one, then the right side is stronger. Okay? So make sure you know how to tell. This is a very simple uh, concept of equilibrium. Okay, again, if uh, equilibrium constant is greater than one, then left side, the acid on the left side is stronger. The base on the left side is stronger. But if equilibrium constant is less than one, Okay, that means the <coughs> left side is favored. Equilibrium favors the left, the reactant. That means the right side is stronger. Okay, the right acid and base is the stronger side. Okay, so make sure you understand this. Okay, uh, so 20, who's the stronger acid? The left side. So HX is stronger. So 20 is A. Okay, 20 is A. Okay, one. So twenty is, I guess, uh, acid base La Chatelier. One, you have a double displacement. You can see it is actually a precipitation. It is a precipitation of silver chloride. Okay, double displacement. So the student performed an analysis to determine the amount of silver nitrate in a solution. So you add sodium chloride to it, and you precipitate out, and you collect it using gravity filtration. And then you dry the precipitate in the oven and you find out the mass of the precipitate. Okay, so the question says, your mass of the precipitate is 5% higher. So where is your error? Yeah, now these kind of, these kind of uh, error analysis is not easy. But if you know it, it's super easy because they always ask you the same thing. If you don't know it, you would have to guess this one. Yeah, this is uh, one of the lab we were focusing on earlier in our AP classes, like first semester, gravimetric analysis. So I just want to recap that quickly because it's likely that you'll see them on three response. Yeah. Um, and then to do this, the purpose for this kind of lab called gravimetric analysis is to find concentration of unknown or molarity of the unknown. Like that kind of stuff, yeah? So I'm gonna draw this out. And then the only way to kind of draw this out, uh, the only way to figure out what, why the answer is D is to draw this out. So the answer is D, by the way. Okay. So here's what you had to do. Uh, you are adding your goal, for, for example, is to find out the amount of Ag nitrate. So this is the silver nitrate. Nitrate we don't care because it's a spectator ion. And what we are doing is that we adding excess. We don't care about sodium, but we do care about chloride. So we are trying to initiate precipitation. So when you add this excess chloride, you're gonna get a whole bunch of silver chloride precipitate, yeah? Now you wanna collect and dry and weigh. So there's two sources of air that will happen when you don't wash. Uh, the, the stuff properly. So here's what happens. You want to pull this over to a funnel, right? So let's say I draw the funnel like such right here. So this is the funnel. And of course the funnel has filter paper. You're trying to collect the solid, of course. And the funnel will allow the rest, whatever is not solid to drain into this flask, okay? So in this case, the precipitate that will be collected on the filter paper is going to be silver chloride. But this is wet because there's a bunch of water on it. Yeah. And what drained through is going to be nitrate. Remember, nitrate didn't do anything. There's also excess sodium. So there's a bunch of sodium, right? Uh, and you also have excess chloride because you added excess chloride. So those are the things that's down there. And then when we have those wet, this is wet silver chloride. You have to dry it. Yeah. So you bake it in the oven, and then you get dry silver chloride. That's it, as simple as that. So here are the two mistakes that they can ask you. Mistake number one is that they forgot to wash uh, the transfer of the precipitate thoroughly. So you wanna make sure that all the traces of silver chloride gets transferred to filter paper. Step number two is this one. 
you also need to wash the precipitate. You gotta wash the precipitate on filter paper thoroughly with water. And we'll explain why. If you gotta wash precipitate on filter paper, wash precipitate on filter paper with water uh, thoroughly, yeah? If you don't, then the wet silver chloride will contain a little bit sodium, a little bit chloride, a little bit nitrate because they are dissolved in water. So again, if the wet silver chloride is not rinsed with water thoroughly, on this wet precipitate, you're gonna see sodium ion, chloride ion, and even nitrate ion. And when they dry in the oven, they become solid, increasing the weight. So if you did not do number two, you'll have higher precipitate weight, higher mass, okay, than what you should have. If you didn't do step one, you forgot to wash entire silver chloride precipitate from the beaker to the filter paper, you're gonna get less mass in your precipitate. So there's two places. So this question says that the mass precipitate recovered was 5% higher than the actual mass. So your error is the last one. The precipitate was not rinsed thoroughly with deionized water before drying. Okay, that was the reason, okay? So galvanometric analysis, two places you have to wash. You gotta wash, so to, when you transfer the precipitate to filter paper, and then when you're filtering, you gotta wash the precipitate thoroughly to get rid of any extra ion that can show up when you dry. Let's look at number 22. Uh, 22, we have data in the set, and this is uh, looks like a strong acid, strong base titration, okay? So let's uh, look at this one. So this one, strong acid and strong base titration, you will get pH seven, only strong and strong. How do I know this is strong acid and strong base? Well, because the equation, sodium hydroxide is a strong base, HCl is a strong acid. So if you were to write the net ionic equation, uh, you would have uh, just H plus plus OH minus, Use water. All the other ions will uh, will uh, are spectator. Yeah. So this is your strong acid and strong base. Now, so how come it does not look like our strong acid and strong base? Because the strong acid and strong base I usually give you, it looks like this. This is pH seven. Okay. Well, it's because it depends how you titrate this, right? So the one I wrote in red you're adding OH minus, and you start with a strong acid. So that's why pH increase gradually. Here, you're adding strong acid, and you're starting with a strong base. That's why the pH goes down. So they're the same though. They're all the same titration. You have a strong base titrated with a strong acid, they're just gonna form water. And that is the only time pH is seven at equivalence point. Okay, and it says it takes about 50 mil to become equivalent. Okay, so that's titration here. Okay, so what do you do with these titration? Let's see. Um, look at the question. So the first question is number 22. Label point R, that is your equivalence point, pH is seven. So which of the following ions are present that is greater than one? So how do you do this, right? So well, we look at this. What is equivalence point? Equivalence point is when your acid and base are completely consumed. So for example, if you write your BCA, H plus plus OH minus to produce water. This is your before and after, okay? At equivalence point, uh, let's say for example, we are 10 and 10. That's what equivalence point means. Do you guys see why? This is equivalence point because the amount of H plus and OH minus is the same. So this is at equivalence. It doesn't have to be 10, 10, it can be five, five, it can be six and six. The point is that they have the same amount. Then you must be at equivalence, okay? And what is half equivalent? Then one of them is half of the other, okay? So you can kind of tell. So if you look at this one, you would minus 10, minus 10, and you would plus 10. So at equivalence point, you only have water. And of course, uh, 10 is water, you also have sodium from sodium hydroxide you also have co minus 
from CO hydroxide, uh, from a from, from a hydrochloric acid. So this is what happens. This is what's present at the equivalence point. So does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what's present here. This one at this point, you have uh, NaCl and water. All right. And beyond equivalence point, you add a more HCl plus. So when you are beyond equivalence point, you would have sodium, chloride, and water, but you also added a whole bunch of H plus and CO minus. So you're gonna have additional H pluses, okay? That's beyond equivalence point, okay? So make sure you understand this. All right, so the question here is at equivalence point. So what ions do you have? Yeah, concentration greater than this. You notice they don't put water. A lot of time they're just the ion because water is not ion, right? So the answer is A for 22. You're gonna get sodium and chloride and the rest is a bunch of water. You're not gonna have H pluses that will B will be beyond equivalence point, right? Okay, so the answer is A. Okay, so 22, the answer is A. Any questions on this one? Yeah. So how come some people says, how come not D? Wouldn't water dissociate into H plus and OH minus? Wouldn't that be D? Well, here's why. Uh, water does not dissociate appreciably. So do you notice that one of the, the questions says, which ions are greater than 0 0.01 molar? Well, now, although water does dissociate into H plus and OH minus, but they're not gonna be 0 0.01. They're so tiny, they're like 10 to negative seven or negative eight, right? It's not gonna be that. So forget about that. So it's just A, okay? Just A, all right, 23. And this is titration, okay, 23. So a student titrated sodium hydroxide with hydrochloric acid. Instead of using 0.1 molar, so the student messed up. He's supposed to use 0.1 molar strong acid, but he used 10 times. He used one molar instead, right? Okay, so how would this uh, graph different? Okay, so do you see that because you use 10 times more uh, stronger. That means the volume will be 10 times less. But you should have used 0.1 molar strong acid. You use 10 times more strong, 10 times more acidic. Wouldn't the volume be 10 times less? So instead of 50, you should be at five. You reach equivalence point at five, literally right here. That's the equivalence point. Your graph will look like this. Yeah. So. Again, you don't need 50 mil to become equivalent. You just need five mil, 10 times less because you're 10 times the concentration. So the whole graph will be squeezed sideways. Okay, so your equivalence point is not gonna be at 50 anymore, it's going to be at five. So which one describe that, right? Um, so if you look at the choices, 23. The initial pH changes, no, because the initial pH is dependent on the molarity of the sodium hydroxide. So 23 is D. The pH far beyond equivalence will be lower than, oh, here's not, that's another notice. Um, okay. The, okay, so let's go through each one, okay? Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is not, they, they didn't choose the one I was, looking for by squeezing the graph closer together. They want you to focus on another difference. So uh, do you see the initial pH, which is 13? That is determined by sodium hydroxide, okay? So this is 13. This is due to sodium hydroxide, okay, per one molar. So this pH is one, that's why pH is 13, okay? So that's not gonna change, <clears throat> excuse me, right? So A is wrong, trace A is wrong, B is wrong. pH at equivalent is always seven when you're equivalent. It doesn't matter how strong your acid and base are because when moles are equal, pH is always seven. So B is wrong, okay? Now, if you continue to add H plus beyond the equivalence point, if you use one mole, if you use 0.1 molar, the pH will be limited at one because here you have lots of H pluses. And if you use 0.1 molar HCl, pH is one. But if now you're using 
uh, not pH one, but uh, <coughs> the molar is not 0 0.1, but if the molarity is now one, then the pH will approach zero instead. So you're gonna see something like this approach zero. One is up here, yeah? Because this one is your one molar HCl. So that means the pH of negative null log of one is zero. So your asymptote becomes zero, where before the asymptote is at one. Why is the asymptote at one? Because the concentration is 0.1 molar, negative log of that is one. So that's why asymptote was one, but if the concentration is one molar, then asymptote would be zero. Okay, so they're saying that that's, that's what they focus on. <clears throat> so the question is D, number, number 23, the pH far beyond equivalence point, so all the way, will be lower than the original graph because your acid is stronger. Okay, so that's what they want to focus on. Okay, let's look at the next one. <clears throat> Uh, page 15, uh, number 24, okay. So 24 is still the same. Okay, same question, yeah, part of the same, same question. So a student collected, conducted an experiment to determine delta H of the reaction. So this is, this looks like a calorimetry. So delta H, yeah, so what about it? A student ran two trials. You can see trial one, you have 0.1 molar HCl. And trial, and you also have 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. The heat released, which is Q, heat released is X. Okay. And you add a 50 mil and 50 mil. Okay. Now, do you see that uh, 50 mil? 50 mil means that they have equal moles. And then the second trial, you have 100 mils of the acid, and you still have 50 mils of the base and the heat release is Y. But the problem with these two examples is that they both have the same limiting. The limiting reagent is sodium hydroxide for both trial one and two, yeah? So if you did not change the amount of limiting, your Q heat release must be the same. So when you have the same limiting, same heat released, same amount of heat released, okay? So it will be same Q. So that's why the answer is B, right? So what do we know about the relationship between X and Y? That the only one that says they are the same is B, X is equal to Y, because the most of X and most of the base reacting are the same in both cases. The fact that you have more X's, don't care. That 100 mil is excess. You can put as much X as you want, it's not gonna change it, right? So the amount of heat release is the same. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what if I use uh, scenario number three? When I put 100 mil for both then, and do you see I effectively double the limiting? So the amount of heat release will be 2X, okay? Because the amount of limiting reagent doubled when I use 100 mils for both, then you're gonna release twice as much heat. All right, so let's look at 25. <clears throat> Number 25, a student makes 10 mils and one molar sodium hydroxide, strong base, with 10 mil, one molar hydrochloric acid. So that is equivalent because the moles are the same. So again, we have 10 mil, one molar, strong base, mixed with 10 mil, one molar, strong acid. So you're gonna end up with 20 mils of water, H plus and OH minus water, and it's gonna be pH seven because you're equivalent. The question says, the temperature of the solution before mixing is 20, the final temperature 26, what is delta H? So you find Q first, mass of the solution, specific capacity for the solution, changing temperature for the solution, that's how much heat is released. You see the mass of the solution is 20 mil, which is 20 gram, because the density we're told is one. The specific capacity for the solution is 4.2, and changing temperature, you heat it up from 26, six degrees. You got to move together without, right? This would be like 42, not 42, I mean uh, 20 times 4.2 is like 82 times 60. 82 times 60 is about, <coughs> what is that about? About five, uh, 50,000, right? Um, uh, 
uh, not 50,000, I mean like almost like 5,000, okay? So approximately 5,000. Okay. So that is Q. So Q is about 5,000 or five kilojoules released. But that's not delta H. Remember delta H, you gotta divide it by moles of limiting. So delta H for the reaction, which is neutralization, is Q, and you gotta put plus minus, right? Divided by moles of limiting. That's the difference. I have five kilojoules and it's negative is exo, because it heats up. And the moles are limiting. That's when you start reading the initial information. You have 10 mil, one molar. That's 0 0.01 mole. It doesn't matter which one, they're the same, okay? So that's how you get 5,000, negative five, not 5,000, I mean, 0 0.01 mole is negative 500, yeah? Kilojoules per mole. So the answer is D, negative 500, yeah? Kilojoules per mole. So this is the calorimetry, yeah? Uh, sorry, negative, uh, let me do this again. 10 mil, one more point zero one. Five K. Okay. Did I make a math calculation here? I got five, about 5,000. So it's uh, 5,000 joules or five kilojoules divided by moles of limiting, 0 0.01. That will be 500. So the answer is D, yes, okay, all right? Okay, the answer key is wrong. The answer key says A, that's not right, yeah. I did not make a math mistake. Did I? No, yeah. It's 5, 500 and it's negative. So the answer is D, not 50. All right, yeah. Okay, good. I think the key is wrong here. Yeah. Well, let's look at the next one, 26. Okay, 26. This is the 26. All right, right here. Okay, so 26 looks like kinetics. Okay, I know it feels like kinetics because talk about ray law. <laughs> it says that, right? So for the reaction represented by the equation is this. So it is, it, we're told that the reaction is first order for both NO2 and for F2. First order. So, which could be the first step, elementary step for the two step mechanism if the first step is slow? So, what is the slow step? Right? So, if this is the overall ray law, your slow step ray law should look exactly the same. So, your slow step ray law will look exactly like the overall ray law. And the only one that looks like the overall ray law is B. You just focus on the reactant NO2 and F2. C is wrong because it's F, not F2. A is F squared. I mean, sorry, not F squared. A is just F2 to the first power. There's no NO2. So the only one is choice B, okay? When you look at the slow step, you just write the reactants and their coefficient becomes the power, becomes the order, only because it's a slow step. So only B has a slow step ray law equals to the overall ray law that is given above. So B is the answer. There's no calculation here. Super easy, yeah? So make sure you know how to do reaction mechanisms and from the ray law. Always focus on the slow step. 27, Lewis structure. That has the smallest bond angle. So choice A is tetrahedral. Tetrahedral, the bond angle is 109.5, right? And B, B is trigonal pyramid. So that lone pair pushes the bond angle a little bit closer, about 107. And choice C is trigonal planar. I know it doesn't look like trigonal planar, but it is because sulfur has three electron domain. And then this is actually trigonal planar. So that's 120, that's big. We want the smallest bond angle. And the last one is bent. I know it looks linear, but it's not linear. Again, sulfur, this is bent. And this, is, this bend is 120 degrees approximately, yeah? Okay, so you're looking for the smallest angle. Well, the answer is B, <clears throat> trigonal pyramid. That lone pair pushes the bonding electron closer together. So 27 is B. All right, let's look at the next one. So make sure you know molecular geometry. They have to do Lewis structure. They also have to do intermolecular forces. Super important, yeah? Okay, let's look at the next one. Next one I have here, 
to do with intermolecular forces, I think. Yeah, look at this, right? You have two molecules, and you, you can see that uh, they're very similar, except that this guy on the right is bigger. They have more nonpolar hydrocarbons, so they have greater dispersion than the guy on the left. Yeah, everything else is identical. So that means that intermolecular force wise, the guy on the right is stronger because there's more London dispersion. That's my guess, right? So mixture containing equal moles or both uses the separate by distillation. Now, distillation is separate by boiling point. So the lower the boiling point, the one that with lower boiling point will distill and vaporize out and get collected first. So the guy on the left will boil off first. So this one will have a lower boiling point and boil boils out first. And the one with higher boiling point boils out later, okay? So that's called distillation. It's a separation based on physical property boiling point. And boiling point is determined by intermolecular forces, right? Okay, based on the diagram above, which identify the substance that will be initially present in higher concentration in the distillate. That means who comes out first? Because the guy comes out first, become condensed to form the distillate. So who comes out first? Will be ethyl acetate, the guy on the left. So we know A or B. So C and D is just wrong. Okay, because they're longer, they're greater dispersion, there should be higher boiling point, right? So A and B, and then what's the reason that? Not because the carbon-carbon bond, so A is just garbage, intermolecular force has nothing to do with covalent bond. Intermolecular force has to do with London dispersion forces here, or dipole dipole or hydrogen bond. In this case, it's mostly dispersion. So it has a shorter carbon chain only two, so therefore weaker London dispersion than the guy on the right has four carbon chain, which is longer and stronger dispersion. So the answer for 28 is B, yeah? 28 is B. Let's look at the next one. Uh, Whoa, this is 29. Okay, 29 to 31, sites, okay? So we're looking at absorbance. So this would be colorimetry, yeah? Photospectrometry, remember using that, uh, what is that thing called? Um, spectrophotometer or photospectrometer, a cuvette, right? And you can see the absorbance changing. But how do you know? How do the absorbance change? Sometimes absorbance increases, sometimes the absorbance decreases. How do you know which one, right? Well, it, uh, it's pretty easy to tell. You just look at the color, right? You can see that your reactant is violet and your product has no color. So your absorbance will go down over time because reactants are converted to product, okay? So because the product is colorless, absorbance decreases with time and it is the case here you can see the absorbance on the table it went from 0.62 and decreases throughout until it leveled about 0.15 as time goes on okay so this is the kinematics so absorbance is kind of like concentration concentration of the violet yeah the violet is the one that has color which will give you the absorbance, okay? Now, usually these kinematics is either zero, first or second order. So how do I know it is first order? I know it's first order because absorbance halves. Look, absorbance went from 0.62 initially, and it becomes 0.31, isn't it half? How much time did it take to half? 150 seconds. And then 0 0.31 becomes 0 0.15, halves again. So every time it halves, the half-life is constant. So only first order has constant half-life. In this case, it's 150 seconds for the violet to disappear. This must be first order. It goes without saying, yeah? Okay, without complicated calculator, we can only tell first order, right? Otherwise you gotta do more complicated calculations. So first order is highly tested because it allows you to determine first order even without calculator. Absorbance half, rate uh, the, the constant half-life, okay? So this is the first order with respect to the violet color, okay? So the reaction between these two is represented. 
is first order and you're told it's first order. I should have read the question first. So that's why the half life is 150. And if you know half life, you know rate constant right away. That's redundant information. If you know half life, you plug in 150, you know the rate constant. If you know rate constant, you plug in half life. They're inversely related. The bigger the rate constant, the faster the reaction, the shorter the half life. So you have a lot of information here, yeah? And you're told hydroxide is excess. You put 10 mil sodium hydroxide mixed with 10 mil. So that's 20 mil. And you take 5 mil transfer to a cuvette. That's the sample holder. And you put a, put in a spectral photometer and you monitor the absorbent. So anyway, we've seen these, right? This is Beer's law, right? Beer's law is uh, absorbance is little a, little b, little c. It just shows you that absorbance and concentration are directly proportional. The slope is little a and little b. The slope is little a and little b, yeah? So again, c is molarity, which is the violet color, and a is the absorbance measure, okay? Like that. And what is a and b? Remember the B constant is the width of the cuvette. Your cuvette is like this. It's like a cylinder, not a cylinder, a rectangular cylinder, yeah? A prism then, okay? So this is B. B is the width of the cuvette, is the distance light must travel. And A is a random constant depending on the reaction. So the question is number 29, how long did it take for 75% to react? Well, I can do this without data table. If I have 100%, it becomes 50% and it becomes 25%, right? That means 75% is gone. And that happens in two half-lives. Each half-life is 150 seconds. Two half-life will be 300 seconds. So 29 is 300. No formula required. It's common sense. 100 become 50, become 25, 25 left. That means 75% reacted. So that is two half lives or 300 seconds. Second one, number 30. <clears throat> what would be the effect of the reaction rate if it's diluted by two? Now, because it's first order, it's going to be directly proportional. If you have the violet color compound right here, C25H30 and 3 plus, the rate would also half accordingly. <clears throat> Right? So the answer is half. So B would be lower. Okay? Exactly how low? It's going to be half as low. So 29 and 30. Okay? Is that all right? It's pretty easy so far. Right? Let's move on to the next question. Uh, let me get rid of this. Um, the next question, I think it's still part of the same question. Yeah? 30. Let's look at 31. Uh, yes, still same part of the question. Now to use the photo spectrometry, we have to choose a particular wavelength. And remember, this sample is that violet color compound and you have to beam light. And you have to choose a wavelength of light that actually absorbs this uh, compound, that this compound actually loves to absorb. So to choose a wavelength, okay, the student record the absorbance of these compounds yeah, in this range, okay? So this is the violet compound, remember, this is the violet, okay? So I want to use this right here. So the maximum absorption for the violet compound occurs about almost 600. So that is the wavelength that you want to use, about 600, because 600 nanometer wave is highly absorbed by this violet compound. And the violet compound is solid light. Imagine, you use, imagine if you use like 400 nanometers, then the violet compound does not absorb light with 400 nanometer. You're not gonna get any absorbance, it's gonna be zero. So picking the right wavelength is super important. And the only way is to generate this plot, put your samples in and see what wavelength the sample absorb light the best. Here, it absorbs about 600 because the solar line, the violet compound peaks absorbance at 600. If you use 400, the compound does not absorb any light. Your experiment failed. You get zero absorbance throughout time, okay? So you gotta pick the wavelength that the sample absorbs the best at, yeah? That is the wavelength. All right, information throughout the question. The students to use to measure this violet compound with the greatest sensitivity. 
what is the best, best wavelength? Do you see it has to be C and D, right? And, but uh, between those two, let's differentiate them. Because only the, so C says, choose this one, because only the violet form absorbs significantly because this wavelength falls in the violet region. So the answer is C. You choose this not because it's the violet region. You choose this because the molecule absorbs significantly at this wavelength. So C is the best answer. Okay. So that's Beer's law. Uh, photospectrometry, it is definitely going to be on the AP in different form. Okay. So let's look at the next one. <coughs> 32. I see ice pop. I see equilibrium. So if I were to, um, let me make a copy of this and then let's do it out, right? And I also see the equilibrium constant is huge. It's like 1500. So it's very big equilibrium constant. That means essentially the reaction will go to completion. The ice pop. So, I mean, you can still do ice pop. What I mean is that the reaction essentially will go to completion because the huge Q, that K, yeah, equilibrium constant. So if I were to do this ice box, this is called ice box analysis, yeah? Okay, you just do the ice box out, you'll see. It will make sense. You have two moles of each in one 100 liter, okay? Now, supposedly I gotta use molarity, okay? But you can see the K is huge. 1500 is a huge number. This means that reaction essentially goes to completion, okay? So that means that you're gonna get almost nothing reactant, okay? You're gonna completely consume, okay? So if you put 0 0.02 molar, because moles per liter for both, you should be have none, it's gonna be so spontaneous, essentially you minus 0 0.02, minus 0 0.02, plus 0 0.02, and plus 0 0.02. So what you do know is that your CO2 produced and hydrogen produced will be equal and the other one will be approximately zero. The reactants will be zero, right? Okay. So which choice essentially says that? Okay, if you look at choice A, almost right, right? If you look at choice A, water greater than CO, uh, no. Water should be same as CO. So A is wrong. Water should be the same as CO. They're both negligible. B is wrong. Water should be less than H2. H2 is your product. Because it goes to completion, you have very little water left. So B is wrong too. C is the answer. CO2, which is the product, must be greater than CO, which is reactant. Yeah. CO2 must be greater than CO. CO approximately zero, right? That's true. Okay. Now, how will this change if the equilibrium constant is tiny? Guys, so can we look at this one? So I'm gonna change the question now. And the only thing I'm changing is the equilibrium constant, yeah. So CO plus water, and you get CO2 and hydrogen. So now I'm gonna say equilibrium constant is tiny. Let's say 10 to the negative six, yeah? So it's less, less than than one, okay? So you still plug in the ice box 0 0.02 because that's what you're told. And this is zero and zero. And now you cannot go to completion. You got a minus X, minus X, plus X, plus X. Does that make sense? Okay. But then because the equilibrium constant is so small, do you see X is very small? These are extremely small, very small. X is very small because equilibrium constant is less, less, less than one, yeah? So that means that uh, your concentrations for reactant is greater, a lot greater. So the concentration of CO is same as concentration of water, and they are a lot greater than all the other X's, yeah? All right, so that's the difference. So the only difference we change is the equilibrium constant. So make sure you understand what the equilibrium, equilibrium constant is trying to tell you, yeah? That is the whole point of this question, okay? Let's move on. Okay, you got this, right? Okay. Let's look at next one, number 33. So again, your goal may not be doing every single multiple choice. Some of the multiple choice questions are pretty hard. Then what do you do? Just make the blank, there's no penalty. 
just move on, right? Take your best guess and move on. Don't like waste like 20 minutes on one multiple choice question. You're gonna slap yourself really hard being silly, yeah? So there's no point of spending 20 minutes on one point, one multiple choice. You wanna make sure you get everything covered, okay? And when you have time, come back to it. But put the, put the answers in. Eliminate and put it in. Sometimes that's the best way, all right? So let's look at this question. Number 33. We got uh, two compounds, silver sulfate, and we got the lead sulfate. So they're different precipitate, yeah? So the question says, one liter of silver nitrate and lead nitrate has Ag plus containing of this and this, and you added K2SO4. Based on the information, which of the following would occur? Good Lord. Yeah, this one is all the words. It's like a free response question, yeah? So this one is, uh, <coughs> precipitate first okay so let's look at this uh, we need to visualize this if you're not good at these questions so here's the visual we have a container that contains two ions you have ag nitrate which is 0 0.02 molar you also have pb nitrate i don't care about the nitrate i care about pb2 plus and then your total is 0 0.001 molar okay don't worry about sig fig and I want to precipitate both of them. So the common sense is to add sulfate because look at the KSP, they both precipitate sulfate, right? So that's why you want to add this, okay? And you add in 0 0.001, okay? 0 0.0010 mole of sulfate. I don't care about potassium because potassium is spectator, okay? All right, so based on this information, who will precipitate first? Now, unfortunately, you got to calculate this to really know this. So you don't need to write icebox, just write down the KSP expression for both precipitate. And you solve for whatever you're adding. You solve for SO4. Solve for <clears throat> concentration SO4 needed. You always solve for whatever is added. So you write down the KSP expression. Let me write that first. So this is square because there's two AG and sulfate. Yeah? And the other one is PB. Okay, so no ice box. You just write down, I'm lagging. You just write down the KSP expression for both precipitate. And what do you do? You plug it in and you solve. What do you solve? You solve for whatever is added, which means you solve for sulfate. Compare them. Okay, so if I plug in the first one, one times 10 to negative five, Ag is 0 0.02 squared, and I'm solving for sulfate, okay? And I will get SO4 two minus. Now you can do this without calculator, okay? So in this case, um, I get a divide 0 0.02 squared, that would be four times 10 to negative four, and the top is one times 10 to negative five. You can do this without calculator, okay? So it's 0.25, 10 to the negative one. So 0 0.025. So one over four is, is, is 0 0.25, right? And this is 10 to negative one. So 0 0.025, 0 0.025, okay? And let's do the other one. The KSP here is uh, for silver, uh, less sulfate is one times 10 to negative eight. So one times 10 to negative eight, PB is 0 0.001, and I can solve for sulfate. And the sulfate here is a lot smaller, a lot smaller, not a little bit, uh, well, not, uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but it's several magnitudes smaller, right? So this is one times 10 to negative five. So what does this mean when you solve for sulfate? This is the sulfate concentration needed to precipitate PBSO4, like this one, yeah? Because you solve for the sulfate that is required to reach equilibrium. And on the left side, you need more sulfate. <laughs> So on the left side, this is the sulfate needed to precipitate what? Uh, silver sulfate. So which one precipitate more easily? Well, the lesser one, right? So the one on the right, you need less SO4 to precipitate lead sulfate. You need more to precipitate silver sulfate. So who's gonna precipitate first? Well, the answer is less sulfate because it takes much lesser SO4 to initiate its precipitation, right? So 33, okay, 
we know A is wrong. Well, well, well we know B is wrong. Uh, sorry. We said that less sulfate will precipitate first, right? Okay. And do you see that uh, you added more than enough? You added 0.001 mole uh, in one liter, right? So that is more than more than 10 to negative five. That is hundred times more than what you need. Okay. But did you add it enough to precipitate this sulfate? Do you see sulfate? You need 0 0.025 moles per liter. You only added 0 0.001. That's not enough, right? So what you have here is showing you that 0 0.001 moles sulfate is enough to precipitate the one on the right, PBSO4. But 0 0.001 moles of sulfate is not enough. Not enough. How do I know it's not enough? Because when I solve for sulfate, I need 0 0.025. Silver sulfate, yeah? Huh? Okay, so the answer is C. Only lead sulfate will precipitate, yeah? It is not easy, guys. So to do this question, you gotta do all that. Okay, a lot of math, a lot of concept, yeah? So if I add more sulfate, then eventually silver sulfate will precipitate out of the solution. But right now, you only add a 0 0.001. You need 0 0.025 moles per liter to, dis to, to precipitate. You don't have enough to precipitate on the left side, the silver sulfate. You don't have enough of it, okay? You need to add more, okay? So that's why C is the only answer, okay? If I add like 10 moles, then D is the answer. Both of them will precipitate. Because I added way more than enough than what is minimally required to precipitate both of them, right? So it depends on your choice here. So C is the answer. Okay. So this is a tough question. I think this is quite tough. So if you stuck on this, just guess. Okay. Uh, next one, number 35, is that photo emission, photo electron spectrum is easy, PS. So <clears throat> here we're looking at calcium and argon. Now, calcium and argon are isoelectronic. They have the same electron configuration. However, calcium has 20 protons in the nucleus, but argon only have 18. So who has a stronger nucleus? Calcium. Calcium has stronger nucleus, which means it's gonna be harder to remove further electrons, yeah? So the PES, for 1s, for both of them, okay? So who must be calcium? Must be X, because calcium has 20 protons. It's harder to remove 1s. And the 301 here is argon, okay? So X is calcium. So you know the answer is C or D. What was the reason? Is it because the mass is greater or the charge is greater? Well, it has to be the charge, right? So D is the answer, okay? D must be the answer because the nucleus of calcium has two more protons, making it a more effective, stronger nucleus, which means it's harder to remove. So X must be calcium, not argon, okay? Okay, look at the periodic table. Calcium has 20 protons, argon only have 18. That's how you tell. All right, easy. 26, uh, 26, let's see what kind of question. A vessel contain argon at high pressure, which of the following statement best helps to explain why the measure pressure is greater then calculate it <coughs> using ideal gas. <coughs> All right. So guys, ideal gas law assume that there's no intermolecular force, no interaction. Ideal gas assume that there's no volume, no gas volume is the gas volume is negligible. They're tiny, doesn't matter what kind of gas. So the question is how come in reality the pressure is greater because ideal gas flow is in ideal condition. How come the real pressure is greater than ideal pressure? Okay. What would be the reason, right? Now, well, the answer is A, right? Answer, answer key says, no, answer key is not A. What the heck? Is the answer key wrong? Am I reading the right answer? So let me see. Uh, why the measured pressure is even greater than calculated? So molar mass of so this is large, significant to 
B is right, it becomes you know, the forces among argon cause them to collide with the wall, less force. If there's less force, there should be less pressure, isn't it? So 36C doesn't make sense. If you have intermolecular force, they're gonna attract less, less collision, less pressure, not greater. We're looking for who is greater. So right now I have A and D left, okay? The combined volume of argon is too large. <laughs> Combined volume of argon atom is too large to be negligible. Yeah, that's the reason. So the gas volume is not negligible. Okay, it's not the molar mass. Okay, so the combined gas. Also, the answer key says uh, thirty-six D. Yes, D is the answer. So they're saying you cannot assume that the, the argon is negligible gas. They are too big. The actual volume, right? And that means that the collision will be probably stronger. That's why higher pressure, that's the best guess, yeah? It's not the molar mass, okay? When the ideal gas talk about the actual gas volume is negligible. It never talked about molar mass at all, okay? You just wanna be small. The smaller, the more ideal volume wise, not the molar mass wise, yeah? But usually they're related, but ideal gas does not talk about molar mass, okay? So D is the answer for 36. Let's look at 37. All right, we have data in the set again, okay? So let's take a look at this. Let me uh, make a copy of this. Okay, so that way uh, I can kind of transfer this so we can at least do some calculation. So 37, I have the question on this whiteboard now. Okay. So usually these kind of questions, you got to read it, read it. Otherwise, we don't know what the heck is going on. So you have to read it. There's no choice. Yeah. Okay. So let me just move a little bit over. It's hard to split the screen. It's crazy. Okay. All right. So 37, 38. All right. So the question is, says, uh, when water is added to the mixture, okay, um, you know, I'm just going to expand at this. Okay. So you have water. So you can see that uh, one of the reactants is water. Okay, so that's water right here. And then Na2O2 right there, and sulfur right there. Sulfur is yellow soft solid, right? Okay, redox reaction occurred. So they tell you oxidation number change. And do you see this is XO and less disorder? So this is scenario number four with delta G with a delta H minus G delta S. You're exothermic with less disorder. So the driving force is enthalpy, delta H. And this is more spontaneous at the lower temperature, okay? So G is negative at lower temperature. Okay, so that's what this. So you got a whole bunch of this, yeah? And number 37 looks like a stoichiometry. I'm looking at grams, I'm looking at limiting and Q. So this is stoichiometry. So I'm gonna put that aside. So there's so much information I just wanted to show, show you. There's a lot of information here. But ultimately, 37 is stoichiometry. Uh, and you can use, cannot use calculator here, right? So two trials are run using excess water. First, you got 7.8 grams of this. Molar mass is 78. Wouldn't that be 0.1 mole? So you write down right beneath it, 0.1 mole to remind yourself. And this is trial one. And then you put 3.2 grams of sulfur. Molar mass for sulfur, sulfur is 32. So it's also 0.1. So trial one tells you that you have point one of both. Who is limiting? It must be Na2O2 because you need twice as much. Okay, so I box the limiting to remind myself that's limiting. I figured out who's limiting. Okay, all right. So do you see that uh, trial two? I'm going to use a different color. Blue. You have... 7.8 grams, same thing, 0.1 moles. And sulfur is 6.4, that is 0.2 moles. So now, who's limiting? Your sulfur is 6.4, which is 0.2 mole. Molar mass is 32, right? You see still, the limiting reactant is still Na2O2. Okay, still. All right. So the question says, both trials yield the same amount of SO2, sure, which identify the limiting and the heat relief, right? So we know the limiting is Na2O2, so it has to be COD. Forget about AMV, they're just garbage. 
So now, based on the limiting, you need to figure out how much heat is released. Is it 30 or 61? So I do a stoichiometry, easy stoichiometry. I have 0.1 moles of sodium Na2O2. The ratio is two moles of Na2O2 will produce 610. 610 kilojoules. So this is 30 kilojoules. So the answer is C. Okay, you can do calculator. 600 divided by two is about 305. And 305 times 0.1 is about 30.5. So the closest answer is C, right? So this is stoichiometry. You figure out two trial, who's the limiting? And then use the limiting to find delta H or Q, right? Heat release, right? Super easy. Just have to be careful, okay? Figure out who's limiting. Make sure you know how to do that. How do you tell limiting quickly? You divide your own coefficient. Which of the smaller is limiting? You divide your own coefficient. The smaller number is always limiting. Yeah. All right. So we got that one. Let's look at 38. Atom of which element is reduced? Reduce is good. Gain electron is reduced. Do you see sulfur went from zero to four plus? That is oxidized because the number increases. If the oxidation number become higher, it must be oxidation. So who's reduced here? Well, oxidation number. Four O2 here is one minus this is peroxide sodium peroxide and O is these two minus here and this is two minus here. So you see it has to be C and D oxygen in peroxide and is reduced. If it's reduced, it must it's not C and D. The answer is C, right? The oxygen in peroxide it went from one minus against one electron becomes two minus. So that is your reduction, okay? That's the reduction, gain electron. When you reduce, the oxidation number must become smaller. So negative one to negative two. So that's easy, oxidation number, okay? Number 39, so any questions on this? Okay, so for 38 has to be the oxygen in N2O2. All right, 39. This is the following statement about thermodynamic variability. Where do we analyze this? We said that delta H is negative, delta S is negative, the driving force, they're both negative. So the driving force is enthalpy, delta H. So the answer, and is it, is this spontaneous? How do I know? Yeah, guys, how do I know if this is spontaneous or not? You gotta calculate delta G or to see if the question tells you, right? So let's calculate delta G. Delta G is delta H, negative 610, minus temperature, 298, times delta S and is negative 7.3. I have to divide by a thousand. So negative 7.3 joules divided by a thousand, yeah? So technically that's how you tell whether this is spontaneous or not, okay? But in this example, I don't have to check because I know the driving force is delta H. The only one that has driving force, delta H is C, isn't it? It's not D, D says both driving force. That would be both ne one negative, one positive, right? Negative H, positive S. So that's not the case. So I know D is wrong. I know B is wrong. And A says is, is unfavorable. It's thermodynamic, but that's not true. This is depending on temperature, right? So A is wrong. So by elimination is C. I don't have to calculate, but you could if you had to. So C is the answer. It must be spontaneous. That means thermodynamically favorable. Delta G is negative. And H is the driving force. All right, okay. You want positive S entropy, you want negative H. So that's the two driving force, yeah. Okay, next one, please. Uh, number 40. So here's number 40. Okay, oh, it's the bond energy one. And remember, if you see bond energy, Delta H, that will be bonds on the left minus bonds on the right, okay? So that's the bond energy one. I don't know why it's not loading. Let me, uh, okay, yeah, okay. So let's take a look at this one. Uh, bond energy right here, yeah? So if you see the question is bond energy, write down the formula for bond energy, okay, which is what I'm gonna do. Uh, it turns out I didn't need this page, yeah? So if you look at the reaction, uh, this is number 40. We have H2, uh, CO2, they're all single bond, and you get two HCl. So the formula for delta H is 
the delta H for the reaction must be the bond on the left, which is a single bond hydrogen, single bond chlorine, minus the bonds on the right. So two times HCl. That's the formula. And do you see that uh, I just plug it in? Hydrogen is 430. Chlorine single bond is 240. Add them. Minus two times HCl is 430. And I can do this without calculating. I got 670 minus 860. Uh, I have an exothermic reaction right here. So that would be uh, 200, 190. So it's negative. So it's an exothermic reaction. So that means the graph must step down. Okay. So which graph is exothermic? And delta H is 190, right? So, well, I'm looking at choice A, right? That's the answer, right? Or the other one is wrong. So A is literally a step down, so it's exo. And 190 is the delta H, okay? Not 240, right? Okay? And it's not D, D is endo, because you step up, okay? Step up is endo. So that's easy, right? So products, uh, reatom, bounds on the left, minus bounds on the right. And next one, 41, a separate question. Look at ionization energy. You can figure out which group it is. Look for the big jump. So I see first to second is three times. So that's like three times. And then second to third, not big jump. And then third to fourth, a big jump. So that's probably group three. That's the biggest jump. So you have the, <coughs> anything is group three has very large, fourth ionization energy, because it doesn't like to lose the fourth one. So X must be three plus. So how does it combine with O2 minus, like aluminum oxide? Mm -hmm. So there's a C, X2, O3. Think about aluminum, okay? Now, even though you mistaken it for group one, uh, some people mistaken it for group one. This is, I know group one is, uh, there is a big jump here, but four and, uh, fourth and fifth shows you that the big jump occurred at third, after the third, not after the first. Okay, if it's first one, the second, third, fourth, and fifth should be all big, but that's not the case. So this is group three, not group one, okay? That's number 41, let's keep going. 41 is C, let's look at 42, please. All right, 42. <laughs> Another equilibrium constant, okay? So you do icebox, okay? So I'm gonna actually just do the icebox here. Two H2S. Now remember H2S smell like rotten egg, skunk. Anything with sulfur, sulf hydrogen sulfide, skunk, and then it's toxic, yeah? And you're gonna get this, and you're gonna get four hydrogen. Now keep in mind the K is small, okay? So always look at the equilibrium constant. You got 0.1 moles of each of the four in one liter. So everybody is 0.1 molar, guys. That's the icebox. I'm doing icebox, okay? So I start with 0.1 molar, and then who has the highest concentration? So you just follow the coefficient. The coefficient for one is two, so minus two X. For the first, second one is one, minus X. And then the plus X, plus four X. You follow the coefficient. And if you write down the icebox in terms of X, then you know who is highest, right? Because they all have initial 0.1. So the highest one is last one, 0.1 plus 4x, the highest. That's it, right? So it has to be hydrogen. And the lowest one will be the first one, 0.1 minus 2x will be the lowest because you minus 2x from 0.1. Everybody else minus less, right? Okay, so that's easy. Ice ball. do you have to calculate so far x? No, you just look at a comparison, easy, right? That's why they give you the same concentrations initially for all of them. So you don't have to compare. So that's, that makes it comparable. Yeah. Right. So this is the heating curve we talked about. You can see that the melting point is zero and the boiling point is 100. This is water, right? And the question is one ATM. So that's why the normal melting point is zero. Normal boiling point is 100. Ice is heated to liquid water and then to water vapor, right? The heating curve is shown. Which of the following list the signs for the changing enthalpy, delta H, and entropy, delta S? 
for process X. Now, process X, you're going from liquid into gas. That is endothermic because vaporization is endo and is creating more and more disorder. So they're both positive. Yeah, they're both positive. So that's the answer. So if you look at the choices here, so the answer is B for boy. 43 is B, endothermic and creating more disorder. So it's easy. Let's look at 44. So we have that equal, uh, this is not equilibrium, but the reaction goes to completion. So that's limiting, we're told. So K must be huge and G is negative. All right, and this is endothermic. The reaction take place in a container and that's 600 Kelvin, 44. What happens to the temperature of the content as the reaction occurs? Now this is endo. So the content is gonna feel cold. That's why it's cold to touch. Every endothermic reaction feels cooler. Exothermic reaction feels hotter. So the content is gonna feel colder. So temperature will drop. So 44, which one says that, right? Uh, temperature must increase wrong, wrong. That's not change wrong. So it's either B or C, temperature decreases. Well, because the reaction is endo, C is the answer, right? Because reaction is endo, okay? That's 44, easy. 45? 45, e, I need to uh, copy this out. Looks like it's pressure, PV goes in uh, P, before and after kind of question, yeah? Because it looks like the pressure is changing. Okay, so I need to have both of them showing, maybe to do 45, yeah? So almost there. <coughs> so, so here's the question, you read it again. A sample of methanol, that's your reactant, is placed in a evacuated vessel, pressure is P1, <coughs> okay. So you put this uh, reactant at 600 Kelvin in a vessel. What is the final pressure after the reaction goes to completion? Oh, okay, this one is not easy. You gotta do a uh, stochiometry first. It says to go to completion. Let me show you what I mean. So I do methanol becomes CO becomes 2H2. Now it says to go to completion. So I'm gonna do BCA. And I have initial pressure is P1, okay? So that means zero, zero. I would minus P1, whatever that is, plus P1 and plus two P1. So the total pressure at the end is three P1 because I produced three times as many gases, yeah? That, you can use common sense or you do BCA. So that means the total pressure is 3P1, okay, uh, after the reaction goes to the completion. But let's see. The question is, what is the final pressure in the vessel after the reaction is complete and the content is returned to 300 calories? Hmm. So the temperature didn't change. So 45, the answer key says D. So it'll be 3P1 then. I thought they're gonna change temperature, yeah. Remember, initially it's P1. You completely consume it, you produce three times as many gases, so the pressure will be triple. And since the temperature didn't change, I don't have to do before and after. The temperature remained at 600. I don't know why they say return, okay? So if the temperature didn't change, then the total pressure is, is that. If the temperature changed, then you gotta do P1 over T1. P2 over T2, okay? So if temperature changes, so you gotta do another adjustment to find out the total pressure. Okay, not this one, okay? Let's go to the next one. Uh, what can be inferred about delta S? Well, S is positive because one gas become two gases, right? Uh, three gases, right? So 46, the answer is C. It must be positive, yeah? And how do we know when well, it's not the other way, right? Uh, there's no other possible choices. So uh, 46, the answer key says C. So your delta G is delta H minus T delta S. H is positive, 
G is negative, so there's no choice. S must be positive. That's the only way you can get negative G, okay? And we also said that one gas become three gases. So there's different ways to explain why they chose to use delta G. If S is negative, G has to be positive, non-spontaneous. That's not the case here. G is negative, spontaneous, because the reaction essentially goes to completion. So 46 is T, easy. 47, wait to the following statement about bonds in the reactant and product. So that would be the delta H. You see the delta H is positive and is endo. So if the delta H for the reaction is all the bonds of the reactant minus all the bond energies for the product and it's positive, wouldn't that mean that bond energy for the reactant is bigger than the bond energies for the product in order to be endo? So the total energy in the bond, every single covalent bond in the reactor molecules is greater than all the bond energies for products, okay? So that's the choice we are looking for. If you look at that, 47, okay? If you look at choice A, the sum of bond enthalpies of the bonds in the reactant is greater than the sum of the enthalpy of the product. Yeah, that's the answer, okay? So choice A, tells you that this is the endo. B is exo, has nothing to do with the length of the bond. It has to do with the uh, bond energy, right? To find the delta H, that's 47. And let's look at uh, 48. <coughs> 48 is, what is it, acid and base? All right, so let's look at 48. You have three different acids, you have three different pH, yeah? Okay, so who is the strongest acid? X, Y, or Z. You can look at the pH and concentration, right? So do you see X is the strongest acid? Because even though it has the least concentration, it has the highest, the lowest pH, the most acidic. So X is most acidic. Having the least concentration, most acidic. That would be the strongest acid. So X would be the strongest acid. So it's either C or D. And then do you see that... Uh, why is the next strongest? Why is the next strongest? Because even though it's two molar, it produced the same pH as a three molar one. So that means why is more effective, more efficient, more dissociation. It is better at dissociation. It has less concentration total, but it dissociated more, uh, more effectively than Z. <clears throat> So it's X, Z, Y, Z, so D is the answer, yeah? So there's no calculation here, okay? No calculation here, yeah? Okay, so weak acid dissociate partially, partial dissociation, strong acid dissociate completely, yeah? All right, that's 48. Let's look at, uh, let's look at 50 here, okay? Let's look at 50 first, uh, 49 is down there. So I have the single displacement, again. Single displacement is also redox because Ion is zero, ion is two plus, that's oxidized. And hydrogen is one plus to zero, that is reduced. Anyway, this is single displacement, redox, and we're doing stoichiometry, <clears throat> all right? So I'm gonna do stoichiometry because I see 30 mil one molar, well, that would be 0 0.03 moles. So I'm gonna write 0 0.03 moles. And I see 0.56 grams. Well, the molar mass for iron, guess what? On the periodic table is 56, almost. So 0.56 grams is 0 0.01 mole there. So that's what they're trying to tell you. 0.56 grams is 0 0.01 moles. You got to take 0 0.56 divided by 56. That is how you get 0 0.01 mole. So who is limiting then? Well, limiting is iron. Okay, I divide by my own coefficient, whichever is smaller. So iron is limiting. So the question is, if that's true, right? Iron is limiting, then everything is based on iron. So HCl is excess, that's true, okay? How much is produced? You see C is wrong. Because iron is limiting, you will produce 0 0.01 moles of iron chloride. Right, one to one ratio. So C is wrong. And you will also produce 0 0.01 moles of hydrogen and, a, and hydrogen at STP 
is in a one mole of hydrogen is 22.4 liters. So wouldn't that be 0.22 liters of hydrogen? So D is actually good, right? My limiting is iron, 0.01 moles. I will get also 0.01 moles of hydrogen. At STP, one mole of hydrogen is 22.4 liters. So that is 0.22 liters. So D is correct. Right? So that would be the answer. And you can see that uh, uh, A and B, we, we, we kind of, uh, so A and B, you can figure out how much is left. Those are axes, yeah. But if you look at the mole ratio, wouldn't we point zero one? Remember, A is also correct. <laughs> Hold on, let me see, huh? Standard temperature and pressure. HCO is in access, so I need twice as much. So point zero one is <clears throat> point zero one. Yeah, A is wrong, I'm sorry. Because it should be point zero one, not point one. <clears throat> if you if you do the BCA right, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, and this is uh, zero zero, you're minus 0 0.01, minus 0 0.02, and plus 0 0.01, plus 0 0.01. So how much HCO you have left is 0 0.01 HCO left, not 0 0.1. So I misread it. A is wrong, and B is wrong. Should be 0 0.01. So the only answer is D. Okay, using stoichiometry. Yeah. Okay. So that will be it. And I think that's the last question, right? Okay, good. So, um, <clears throat> when you do titration like this, you see this is the multiple choice, yeah? On the real AP, how many multiple choice do you have, guys? Yeah, yeah, 60. So, not 50, yeah? So 60. So let's say whatever you get for multiple choice, you double that. That would be and that, a way to estimate, forget about free response, yeah? So if you double that, okay? If you are 79 to 100, that is a five, <laughs> yeah? And so let's say you got uh, 30 out of 50 on the multiple choice, then you just double that. So that would be 60. So that means you're like a three, okay? If you got 40 out of 50, you double that, that'll be 80, right? So that means you're barely a five. So for ABCAM, you're going for B plus, for example, like 82 to 85 is usually a good phi, yeah? Okay, so that is the easiest way to do your actual score. Of course, uh, free response is a little bit harder for most people. That's why we've been practicing free response. Multiple choice is easy. The answer is right in front of you, right? There might be a few hard ones, but free response, you gotta be able to come up with what, what's going on, right? So focus on free response, what you should do, is to actually look over a lot of the free response question that we have done and then to see how you can answer them without looking like i was going to i was just anticipating there would be extra time this week so i actually <clears throat> I, I, I didn't want to rush through all the questions but uh what i will do is that in the future i want to look at 2021 the test that's released right I think we may have done one question already, but uh, 2021 is released. So you can see what the question is. So let me just uh, show you that, okay? I'm gonna turn this off. Yeah. So I downloaded it. And if you are familiar with the topics, the questions are not that much different. There's not too many, if you can, there's not too many variations that they can quiz you. It's all the same variation. It's not like physics is a bunch of different way or bio, like infinite number of way. Okay. Chemistry is very predictable. Every year is the same kind of question. Uh, so I was trying to show uh, chemistry. Hmm. Okay, it's released online. So I'm just gonna give me a few more minutes. Yeah. So I just wanna show you something. So this is from last year, uh, 2021, okay, first response question. And you kind of take a look at this, um, you know, what kind of big questions are, are tested, right? So if you look at the first question, right away is Ka, that's acid and base. I think we did this one together. So we calculate the pH of that ice box. So it's easy. Okay, expression, ice box, super easy, right? And you draw a little structure. 
and this is methanoic acid, Lewis structure, then you talk about the bond angle, bond energy, whatever, right? And then you have this KB, this is base ice box. And you have this base ice box, write a balance in that equation uh, between them. And then, you know, it's acidic base or neutrals. It's kind of like ice box, right? And then, uh, and then you have this one, is this redox? So do the oxidation state. So this is the foundation. If you can't do oxidation number, then you screw. You have to know how to do oxidation number to know who's oxide, who's reduced. And this is the pressure, it's probably PV. So I will those, okay. Well, even, that's it, that's and spectrometry. So this is the isotopes. That's why they're different masses, 28, 29, 30, then the percent, right? And you write the electron configuration. You know, talk about intermolecular force, SiO2. What kind of compound is SiO2, guys? SiO2 is called silica, quartz, glass, Network covalent. SiH4 is London dispersion. That's a huge difference in strength. Strength. That's why SiO4 is a solid. Intermolecular force. And then you have uh, this entropy, S. Is it a plus minus reactant? Right? Easy. Stuff like that. So it's like, and is it thermodynamically favorable? Then you look at delta G, delta H, and delta S, right? If it's favorable at all temperature, that means you have to be exothermic, you have to have more disorder. H has to be negative, S has to be positive. Okay. And then there's the PS, the same thing, binding energy. This is the electron configuration. So this is the first one is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. This is magnesium. Right? And then I ask you some of the question, electron configuration. And wavelength. If you know wavelength, you can calculate frequency, you can calculate energy. So that equation is given. In case you forget, guys, right? If you know wavelength, you know frequency, you know energy. You just have to know one of them. They give you wavelength, you can find energy and frequency. They give you energy, you can find wavelength and frequency. They give you any one of those three, there's redundant information. You can find the other one. Okay. That was number two. So those, remember the first three are 10 point questions. So you see that uh, they're, they're highly predictable. And look at this one, this is spectroscope. Uh, Spectrophotometry, this is the cuvette, Beer's law, because copper two plus is blue, right? So you can use that to monitor the rate. You have nanon equation, you have moles, you find molarity, stoichiometry, and then you do the titration graph, you know, the, the, the ABC, the, the, the molar, the, the absorbance right here. So using absorbance, you can estimate the concentration. So Beer's law, all the stuff that you've done, there, that's your first three, yeah? The most difficult one is not difficult at all. And then you have four, five, six, seven, yeah? Okay, so I just wanna show you that you still have plenty of time to really bring up chemistry. Know what your issue is. If you don't know oxidation number, do that. If you forgot how to draw Lewis structure, gotta review that because Lewis structure tells you the molecular shape, tells you the bond angle, tells you polarity, tells you everything. Tells you the formal charge, all based on Lewis structure. Got to know them. Got to know intermolecular forces as well, right? All righty, guys. Then we'll stop here. Okay. I'll see you guys later. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye.